It takes courage to step out in obedience to God. It takes courage to stand strong in the face of trials and discouragement. It takes courage to persevere. So how is your courage today? Where is your courage found? Let's talk about that as we continue our study on the seven C's. That's straight ahead as Arkansas Live starts right now. Before we get started today, uh, I, I, again, I feel impressed. Let's pray for all those that are in authority. And let's pray for those of you that are facing uh, situations, obstacles, challenges, and you need courage. Would you join me? Father, first of all, we pray for all those in authority. We pray for our president, our vice president, our governors, our mayors, our city officials, senators, representatives. We pray for police officers. We pray for all those in authority. Father, we pray for their courage today, courage to do what's right, courage to uphold the oath of office, courage to stand against their accusers. And Father, we pray that they would have wisdom and knowledge to know what to do in every situation, to do what's right for the American people, to do what's right for our citizens. And Father, I pray for every person watching today. I ask you to give them courage to live their life to stand up for what's right, to stand up for truth. Courage to go against the grain, swim upstream. The courage to stand on your word. The courage to stand against the enemy. And I stand with them, Father, and I rebuke the enemy. And sickness and disease and poverty and lack and emotions and hardness. I stand against the wiles of the devil. I thank you, Father, that today, you're ministering your peace, your love, your joy, your health, your strength to everybody listening to the sound of my voice. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be encouraged today. Welcome to Arkansas Live. We've been talking about the seven C's, and here they are. I want to read them to you again. Basically, character, commitment, confidence, consecration, courage, compromise, compassion, all these seven C's make up what we call character. Character is built. <clears throat> it's not born. Character is learned. Character is, is taught, modeled. And the Bible is full of examples of godly character. And that's what I want to encourage you in today. We're looking at courage, one of the seven C's. And uh, by definition, let me read it to you again. Courage is boldness not arrogance, not haughtiness. Courage is strong, conquering, hardened to difficulties, prevailing. It doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It matters how many times you get up. Steadfast, obstinate is the opposite. <laughs> We're not talking about being stubborn and obstinate. Resolute. Resolve. Courage is something that we receive from our covenant with God and our understanding of who God is. And courage comes from the word. When it said David encouraged himself in the Lord, it means that he went to the Psalms and he encouraged himself, reminding himself of who God is. You know, you can even go all the way back to Job Job was one of the first books of the Bible, not the first, but one of the first books of the Bible in chronological order. And uh, Job stood against all kinds of odds. Now, I know we've heard terrible sermons out of Job, uh, a story of suffering. Actually, the book of Job is not a story of suffering as much as it is a story of faith. Suffering occurs but it's Job's response, it's his answer to the suffering that makes it such a great book and Job such a great man. He had courage and Job had no mediator. He didn't have Jesus that he could go to. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. I just don't know how to contact him. I just don't know how to get in touch with him. 
he, he, he relied on and depended on a redeemer, a mediator, a go-between, somebody that would stand in the gap for him. Well, that's who Jesus is. And Jesus has already stood in the gap, so to speak, died on the cross, made himself an offering for sin, took upon himself all your infirmities. There's nothing that you're facing that Jesus hasn't already faced and overcome it. And of course, in 1 John 5, 4, it tells you that you've been born of God, that you are now an overcomer. But anybody that walks through this life needs courage. I remember reading a story about President Abraham Lincoln. And if you can only imagine, if you know American history, the stress and the pressure that man was under for four years, the most horrible war this nation has ever experienced. And this war was, this was American killing an American. This, this was America fighting itself. Brothers, Americans killing each other. And it, it, it I believe, is one of the things that contributed to his poor health. Of course, he was assassinated, but he, he was suffering greatly. If you ever studied the history and saw the pictures, he was suffering greatly from stress and depression. And the decisions that he had to make about the war were just almost mind-boggling. And one day, as the story is the history that I was reading, one day, an elderly lady uh, made an appointment to see President Lincoln. And of course, you know, the process and the security wasn't near what it is today, <laughs> anywhere near. I've been to the White House several times, and my Lord, it takes almost several hours just to get through the process. Even if you have been cleared, and even if you have a passport, and you've been checked out with security and all that, it still takes an hour or so. And she went in to see President uh, Lincoln and introduced her, and he, as the gentleman he was, sitting behind his desk, and the, the lady walked in, and he came in and greeted her, and he sat down behind his desk and said, Madam, what can I do for you today? <laughs> and this little lady, precious little lady, she said, Mr. President, you can't do a thing for me. I didn't come here to ask you for anything. You have more than enough to take care of. I came here to encourage you, to be a blessing to you. And I baked you some cookies. <laughs> she had a little basket of homemade cookies. And, it's, and she gave them to the president of the United States. And it so blessed him. It, it, it disarmed him because, you know, he was prepared to deal with whatever she had on her heart, but she didn't have anything. She just wanted to bless him. She said, I found out what kind of cookies you like, and I baked you your favorite cookies. She encouraged him. Don't you know those that are in high places of authority need encouragement? I remember, this was several years ago, of course, because the governor that I'm referring to is no longer in office, but he was an honorable man, and he served the state of Arkansas well. And one day I just felt, and I'd known him, we were friends, and, and I, I called and made an appointment to see him. And of course, they wanted to know what I wanted to see him about. And I said, well, uh, and I told them it was just a, a general visit. And because we knew each other, they, uh, of course, gave me the appointment. And I walked in the office and he had his assistant there. She was there to take notes or whatever. And uh, he asked me the similar situation. He said, well, Happy, what, what can I do for you? I said, nothing, not a thing. I said, I'm here to ask you what I can do for you. What can I do for you, Mr. Governor? Can I help you in any way? Can I serve you in any way? Can I pray for you in any way? You have no idea what a difference that makes in a governor, a president, a senator, congressman, people, a police officer, you have no idea what that, that does to them to know that you are there for them. Early in our ministry as a church, one year we took a, a second tithe and offering in our church service. And we went down to the uh, city board, uh, um, uh, 
not the city board, um, down to the mayor's office. And we went in and I presented, uh, I'm sorry, we had a, we had a Christmas party for our staff, church, and we invited the chief of police at that time, uh, this was many years ago, to come and be a part. I'd, I'd gone down there to do several things, the reason I got my story mixed up. And at this particular time, we took an offering for the Little Rock Police Department. I think there were like 300 officers then, and we took an offering, a sizable offering, tens of thousands of dollars, and we took it down and we gave it to the chief of police to be distributed to every police officer for a Christmas gift. I don't know how much it, it wound up being like something like $300 or, or 30 or $50 a piece, whatever it was, I don't remember. It wasn't a large amount for each officer, but it was the thought that the people of Arkansas and the people of our church were praying for you. We love you. We thank you for doing your job. And we presented to the chief of police. And I'll tell you what, that tears came to his eyes. And of course, he went back and distributed. I don't know if you can do that today, but he distributed among the officers and they all got a certain amount of money. I still have a file folder of all the letters, thank you notes that we got from those officers and their wives or their spouses thanking us for just, you know, a small token of our appreciation, just to know that people appreciate them and what they're doing. You know, if you want to do something over the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, and you want to show your love and appreciation to somebody, you ought to do it to the police force. Do it to the police officers every time you see one. If you see them in a restaurant or cafeteria, buy their lunch. If you see them on the street, walk up to them and give them what we call a Pentecostal handshake. Give them 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. You know, they get very little thanks for doing their job. And they're putting their life on the line every day for you, for citizens of your community. You're not bribing them, of course. You're just blessing them, giving them a gift. Then we were part of the, what we call Peace Officers Prayer Partner Program established years ago by a minister in, Dow in uh, Tulsa. And we prayed for our police officers by name. We had their, the role. And we sent them birthday cards on their birthday, Christmas cards. And it created such, you know, <laughs> the day after we gave that big offering to the police department, police cars were circling our parking lot. What were they doing? They were flabbergasted at a group of people that would bless them like this. And I had, I had several of them tell me that, you know, uh, their family member needed medicine. They didn't have the money, so they used that money to buy the medicine or it didn't enhance their Christmas or whatever. So you can encourage anybody. Start at home encouraging your children. Now, as I said, these are pastoral messages. Husbands, encourage your wives. Encourage them. Buy them. You know, you can go to Kroger's and they have pretty fresh cut flowers out there in a little vase in a bowl with water. You can buy a bouquet of them for 10 bucks. Buy her a, a bouquet of flowers and take it to her. No special occasion. I just want to encourage you. I appreciate you taking care of our home, raising our children, washing the dishes, washing our clothes, cleaning the house. I just want to encourage you. Wives, you could do the same for your husbands. We can all do something. Do that for your kids. Kids, do it for your parents. If you really want to bless somebody, go into the nursing homes where people are sitting most of the day. They don't have any interaction or very little interaction with any other human beings because when you get old and wrinkled, nobody wants to touch you. Just go in there and touch them. Just go in there and encourage them. Uh, encourage young people that are trying to make a difference, that are trying to, you know, make something uh, of their lives. I encouraged a young lady just the other day. I had uh, called uh, our family physician, our, our primary care physician, to to get my uh, lab reports because I have a physical every year. And the lady that answered the phone uh, was a Hispanic lady. And she, I could tell she was really doing her best to articulate in English uh, what my lab reports were. And I could tell that she was really strugg struggling, but she was doing a good job uh, with English. Well, you think that's hard. You, you go to Mexico or Italy or France or somewhere, and you try to talk 
in a language that you haven't learned. And so I complimented her. I said, and I called her by name. I said, I said, your English is so wonderful. I, there were sometimes I had a hard time uh, understanding her, but I made an effort because I knew she was trying hard. I said, your English, I said, I am so proud of you. I said, your English is so good. You must have worked hard on this. And, and I said, I just want to commend you uh, for working so hard uh, to speak distinctly and clearly uh, in, in the English language, even though I knew she was Latino. And she thanked me so much. She said, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> it doesn't take much to encourage someone. When you go through the checkout stand at the grocery store or department store or wherever you are, man, you, people need encouragement. You can encourage them. If you go to the same grocery store every week, you probably see the same checkout people, the same ladies or men that are checking you out. Encourage them. Say something nice to them or about them. I just want to seed you with this. You can encourage people every day, all the time. Now, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Where, where, where does encouragement come from? Well, it comes from God. It comes from his word. And uh, let me finish this. Um, courage um, it, uh, uh, in its original source uh, comes from God himself. God is the source of all things that pertain to our life and godliness. And it's through the knowledge of him. I had Psalm 39, 7 I wanted to read. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Uh, in Psalm 39 and verse 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in you. That right there, that one line, that one scripture verse my hope is in you. That's encouraging yourself in the Lord. And then we go over to Psalm 42. And let's look at verse 5. Psalm 42, verse 5. Um, it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. Mm. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. You can, you, can, you can encourage yourself in the Lord by reading these verses to yourself. Uh, now let's go over to uh, Psalm, well, let's go to Romans chapter 4. And I want us to see this uh, about Abraham. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Now, this is Abram, Abraham. Uh, and being not weak, uh, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. That was the promise God made to Abraham. And he, he was not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, it didn't say he was in denial it didn't, it, he didn't, it didn't say he denied that he was 100 years old. That, faith is not denial. Denial is, is not faith. Faith does not deny what exists. Faith takes the word of God and denies its right to exist if it's, if it's from the devil, if it's sickness, disease, heartache, famine, whatever. He, it, faith takes the word of God and replaces what exists. It might be a fact, but it's not the truth. The truth is what God says it is. So he was not weak in faith. He didn't consider his own body, according to the promise, what God said about him, had nothing to do with the age of his body. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, he grew strong by giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Now, that's, that's encouraging yourself in the Lord. I can't help but 
think about every time I read this, he was fully persuaded. <laughs> Years ago, and of course, you have to understand my roots and histories in country music. And there was a song, I think it was recorded by David Houston, called Almost Persuaded. Almost Persuaded. Well, thank God Abraham wasn't almost persuaded. He was fully persuaded. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Encourage yourself in the Lord that what God had promised, this is what he was persuaded fully of, that God can't lie, and that what God had promised, he would perform. That's encouraging yourself in the Lord. Now, next point, courage comes from the knowledge of the truth. Whew, there's so many things in our world today that are not true. They're lies. Everything from fake news to, to things that, even, that you might even hear uh, from the pulpit or from Christian television even. There are things that are not true. And some of the people that speak these things are not necessarily trying to deceive or mislead or lie but they don't have all of the truth. Uh, they don't have all the truth of the matter. Have you ever, because I have, I, I, I tell them myself, and I know you have too, have you ever seen or heard someone, it doesn't make a difference where they are on television, in person, in church, where, and you, you just, you formed an opinion or a judgment of them by the way they looked and what they said? And you automatically categorize them in a category that was, that was uh, maybe not true. Only to find out later, maybe a day or a week or a month or a year, that you had mischaracterized them, misjudged them, and what you thought about them was not true. Have you ever done that? I have. And every time I have done that, I have repented to the Lord and asked Him to forgive me and to ask the Holy Spirit to help me control my tongue, and um, I've been smart enough not to say it to anybody else, but I thought it, and I, I, I was convicted over the fact that I was wrong about that person, and I shouldn't have even thought it, much less said it. And I asked God to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and ask the Holy Spirit to help me control my tongue. Jeannie used to always quote a scripture in Psalm where it says, I will give heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue and keep my mouth with a bridle. Boy, that's where we need to start with ourselves. And only to find out that what you uh, thought or what you said or anything like that uh, was not true. You may have thought, and this is the, the biggest area I had to deal with, you, you thought, you know, that person can't be a Christian. Look at the way they talk. Look what they say. Look what they do. Look at this, this and that, that. Only to find out later that they either got saved or they were saved and they love the Lord and, and blah, blah, blah. And you think, oh, my goodness. I didn't know they were a Christian. I didn't think they were a Christian uh, because of this or that or whatever. And I thought, well, I just have to repent and ask God to forgive me because they are a Christian. Now, they might be a carnal Christian. They may not be totally sanctified or, uh, you know, approved by you. But that doesn't change their relationship with God. If they've asked Jesus to come into their heart, they believe he's the son of God and confess it with their mouth and believe in their heart, they're saved. They may be a baby Christian. They may not be a full-grown Christian. They might, may not be spiritual Christian. But, you know, all this time, they had God in their life. They had Jesus as their Lord but you didn't see it and you didn't know it. Well, it's best not to judge anybody. You learn that after a while. And I have proven it time and time again. When I see or hear something and I think, I, that doesn't sound like they're a Christian to me, but I don't say anything. And I'm so glad I didn't because come to find out they knew the Lord. And you think those thoughts because of what you see and hear, which is only a, a carnal reaction to things, but then you repent so I, real, I learned to, th to think, okay, I'm going to wait and see. I'm not going to say anything. I'll just, I'll just hide and watch, wait and see. And then I'm so glad I did because then I find out, you know, they repented or 
I, I have a friend, a minister friend, known him for years. And I hear people criticize him often, even today, even though his embarrassment of his sin, his national sin went around the world back in the 80s and he bared his soul on television and, and, and cried out to God and asked God to forgive him and everybody else to forgive him. And people, even ministers today, are still making fun of him because of what he did. I know the man. I've known him for years. He's a born-again, spirit-filled, God-loving man and had a ministry that reached around the world. He just made a mistake. And while they're criticizing him and saying all this stuff about him to the negative, let me ask you a question. When he went on national television and cried out to God and said, God, forgive me for I've sinned. I wonder how many other people could do that, knowing that it was going to destroy his ministry, destroy his family, but he did it anyway because of his heart. Oh, he sinned in his mind and his flesh, etc., so forth. But his heart was right. He cried out to God. Now, how many of his critics, I wonder, could do that? Because you tend to want to hide your sin. You tend to want to cover it up, cloak it, put it in the closet. You don't want everybody to know. You certainly don't want to go on national television and cry out to God and say, God, forgive me for I've sinned against you. But he did. I think he's to be more commended for bearing his soul and suffering the consequences that he suffered than to try and hide it and make excuses for it. Because I talked to him on the phone after this sin was exposed. I had I'd known him for years. And I called him to help him to see what's going on with you. How can I help you? What's the problem here? He was a broken man. I don't know that he ever recovered from it. But if he was willing to confess his sin before a world and ask God to forgive him, he deserves credit for that. And I'm sure he'll get credit. And if he was sincere, God forgave him, no matter whether people do or not. So this is all part of courage. Now, we're going to continue this tomorrow. Be sure to join me uh, for the next Arkansas Live as we talk about the seven seas. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.